Well, hello and welcome. I'm Megan Mance with the Homeland Security and Defense Forum, and it is my honor to moderate a fireside chat on the evolution of federal cybersecurity. We are joined by two of our nation's foremost cybersecurity leaders, Congressman Jim Langevin and Mr. Chris Inglis. The Congressman has served as chairman of the cyber subcommittees for both the Armed Services and Homeland Security Committees. We're proud to say he's been a longtime supporter of HSDF, and joining the Congressman is our first National Cyber Director, Chris Inglis, who's had a distinguished career within the National Security Agency, where he previously served as Deputy Director. Congressman Langevin and Director Inglis served together on the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, and we are delighted to have them here with us today. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, and great to be here. And I know our time is limited, so with that, I'd like to jump right into questions. And Congressman Langevin, I'd like to start with you. So the creation of the Office of the National Cyber Director was one of the most important recommendations that came out of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. What are some of the tangible things you would like to see this office accomplish in both the near term and the long term? Well, um, you're right. It, it is. Uh... Uh, in an incredibly important office uh, and one of my top priorities. You know, one of the main reasons that I, I thought this office was so important was because it was clear that we needed a greater level of strategic coordination across the federal government on, on cybersecurity. So you know, we have uh, departments and agencies that, uh, in my opinion, have uh, been for too long, been siloed uh, and operating with different resources, capabilities, and strategic priorities. And, we really need to align those efforts and resources in order to maximize that effect. So the, uh, the, the National Cyber Director plays a, a leading role there. Uh, that will be one of the, the, the great, um, that'll be of great importance as agencies implement requirements of the president's executive order on uh, improving our, our, the nation's cybersecurity and as we move towards zero trust architecture. And, and of course, uh, strategic coordination doesn't stop uh, with the federal government because uh, also the, the NCD is the, the key really interlocutor between um, uh, the federal government and the, and the private sector. So uh, it's, a, it's a key position that I think is long overdue. It's one of the, the main things that I think has been missing in our overall cybersecurity uh, strategy, having that kind of quarterback on the field that is going to uh, kind of pull everything together. And so I, I am very honored, I should have started out with this, to be here and sharing the stage with the first National Cyber Director, Chris Inglis. As you mentioned, we served on the Savage Space Solarium Commission together. Um, Chris was one, my number one pick for uh, the position as the first director and couldn't be more thrilled that he's on the job and uh, firing all cylinders. So, Director Inglis, you know, based on just what you heard from the congressman, how is ONCD working to operationalize some of the goals and objectives uh, that he laid out for your office? Yeah, well, Megan, thanks very much uh, for the question. I'll answer that straight away, but, but I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say right up front how grateful I am and everyone should be for Congressman Langevin's leadership for 22 years in the Congress, many of those years focused very specifically on cyber. Um, the answer that he just gave in terms of the importance of the various changes that have taken place um, with some degree of legislative inject and the executive branch taking it from there um, have been monumental in the last three to four years, not least of which two years ago with the introduction of legislation that created the position that I'm in, um, essentially gave greater authority and resources to other line organizations. All of that, I think, comes at a time of great need, um, and I give high credit to Congressman Langevin and his team for essentially leading that charge. Um, with respect to the Office of the National Cyber Director, um, I agree wholeheartedly with Congressman Langevin um, in terms of how to think about it. Um, there are essential foundations of the cyber ecosystem that we absolutely have to develop if we're to make sure that the confidence that we need to have in our personal activities, our kind of business activities, our societal aspirations, critical functions, if we're to have confidence that they work as desired, uh, we have to make sure that we have coherence in the various roles and responsibilities that lay into that space. We have to make sure that that coherence is based increasingly on a collaboration, not merely a division of effort, and that we achieve resilience by design. The responsibility of the National Cyber Director is focused on those three attributes. 
Um, we have to make sure that using this newfound authority and the resources given to it, the National Cyber Director, that we drive coherence, drive collaboration, and resilience by design, not merely responding to crises, but avoiding those. There are some recent successes that I think that we've had. We have very strongly engaged the private sector. Um, just this week, um, we've engaged the healthcare um, leadership, uh, healthcare sector's leadership, by bringing CEOs to the White House to have a discussion where we take their influence as much as we might wield some influence in describing what that new relationship should be. Um, we need to get to a place where we actually together can do things that neither one of us can do alone, the private sector or the public sector. Building on the executive branch's declaration of Executive Order 14028, probably well known to most of this audience, uh, which essentially was the president's signature cybersecurity policy achievement in saying that we are going to now practice the cybersecurity we've long talked about. My office has taken responsibility for its implementation. And I think we've made some fairly bold progress over the last year in, in installing the fundamental attributes in that technical architecture, but equally important in, in on top of that, beginning to practice what is called a zero trust architecture strategy, which is really about how do we actually defend architectures that are increasingly defensible and how do we use our buying power to drive back into the private sector the provision of inherently resilient and robust components of that architecture. Uh, we've worked with the Office of Management and Budget on taxonomy to ensure that we understand what we would buy, to understand how we buy that, and to then have some performance metrics so that we can assure the Congress that the dollars and the authorities granted to us are essentially adding up to what they should. Um, and then finally, we're working our way through what would be the tenets of a national cybersecurity strategy to connect all of those things that we've done, all of those things that we must yet do, um, ultimately with the goal of driving coherence, collaboration, and resilience by design. Um, to the extent that Congressman Langevin and others had a vision for the National Cyber Director, that's my daily mandate to try to realize that right, you know, in, the, in the things that we do. Great, well, thank you for that overview. That's very helpful. And clearly ONCD is already on their way to doing many great things in such a short amount of time. And I did want to ask, so there were several recommendations that were still um, are still unmet from the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Just curious from your perspective, Director Inglis, are there any of those remaining recommendations that might be very helpful in terms of what you're trying to accomplish? Well, first, let me give credit where credit is due to the Solarium Commission and to the Congress for picking that up and running with it. Um, I think the uh, creation of the Office of the National Cyber Director, um, present company accepted, um, you know, was a very significant um, kind of piece of progress, which actually declared that coherence, collaboration, kind of trying to make sense of the parts was important. So, so that has a lot of downstream effects. Um, describing not just what um, collaboration might look like, but then creating in law the opportunity for the cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency to create an instance of that collaboration in what was called by Solarium as the Joint Cyber Program Office, what is now being called the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative. Forget the terms, but, but think about that actual collaboration where private and public sector uh, subject matter experts, not just policy experts, can combine their efforts to discover and address kind of threats in this space together. That's a very solid foundation, the downstream of which can then begin to implement that. So what remains to be done? Um, there's a joint cyber um, or joint collaborative environment which might provide some more structure in these various diverse organizations kind of having the ability to deal with one another um, kind of in a policy framework and an architecture where it's just easier to exchange diverse views and perspectives. Uh, that there might be a, a Bureau of Cyber Statistics that has the ability to make sense of a diverse set of information out there so that we can understand trends and then properly serve the private sector in using the scarce resources to address their needs, right? There is um, kind of activity that might be focused on um, how do we define systemically critical infrastructure so that we can have a repeatable process, again, principally serving the needs of the private sector, not the government in and of itself. Those are all things that are in various states of consideration. Um, I think that they all continue to have merit um, the administration will advise and kind of counsel the, um, the legislative branch as it tees those up and considers those. 
Uh, but, but my read of the Solarium Commission is, is that they remain good practices, borrowing from other nations who've gone before and certainly borrowing from the expertise of a private public group of people who framed those recommendations in the first place. Great, thank you. And so Congressman, I did wanna ask, is there pending legislation to continue to support the Cyberspace Solarium Commission? And what would you like to see come next in terms of you know, related congressional efforts? Yeah, so um, as usual, Director Ingos and I are on the same page and uh, completely agree that uh, uh, the joint collaborative environment is a, uh, is a high priority item. Uh, again, the, the Solarium Commission, uh, when it issued its final report, had some 80 recommendations. We turned those recommendations into legislation. Uh, we were able to get close to 30 of them done uh, in the first year after the, uh, the commission concluded its work and the Congress took up uh, the cause. And, and, and uh, obviously one of those major findings uh, recommendations was the creation of the National Cyber Director. So the things that are left undone, joint collaborative environment, as I mentioned, uh, also uh, systemically important, important critical infrastructure, basically codifying that process, designate uh, what that is. And uh, Bureau of Cyber Statistics is another one that I'd like to see enacted. And then uh, also I'd like to see the Cyber Diplomacy Act uh, pass the Congress. So joint collaborative environment would be this new social contract between um, the government and, and uh, private sector, uh, critical infrastructure, especially high level uh, critical infrastructure. Think in terms of, you know, if a, if a company is attacked uh, by a, a ransomware attack or some type of a, a cyber attack that takes it offline, uh, it, it's not just the company having a bad day, but the country having a bad day. So in that realm, it has to be mature agencies, or entities rather, that, that can act on the intelligence that would be shared with it. But we want to create a, a common operating tool so that we're sharing intelligence and information in real time, not just passing emails back and forth, but both the, say, the, the, the government and the intel community and the private sector critical infrastructure can see and, and share these, these threats in, in real time and then be able to react to them, address the problem. Next, um, codifying the process of creating systemically and in, in, uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, it's the, the uh, most critical of critical infrastructure. So then, you know, again, then supporting them in their cyber defense through closer operational collaboration with the federal government. Uh, that's to be a process for determining what those entity, who those entities are. Then the Bureau of Cyber Statistics, uh, basically a centralized office for statistical analysis on cybersecurity and cyber incidents basically to help us better understand the causes and the consequences of incidents. Uh, basically, what, what tools and technologies are working best. You know, right now, we don't really have hard data as to where we or, or, or companies should spend their next cybersecurity dollar. So uh, this would help answer those questions and uh, basically how well the, the, you know, the, uh, the, the policies are in place, that, uh, whether they're working or not to prevent uh, you know, cyber attacks from, from occurring or being successful. And then finally, so I guess I mentioned the Cyber Diplomacy Act. I, I want to codify the bureau, a, a bureau focused on cyber at the, the State Department. Very glad to see that the State Department created the Bureau of Cyberspace and Digital Policy. However, the, the bureau needs long-term viability and can't be subject to the whims of one administration or another. We saw what happened in the previous administration, where uh, uh, basically the it was Chris Painter at the time was an ambassador rank position on cyber. That position was basically eliminated and we ceded the policymaking authority or the, the presence of the United States in overseas policymaking bodies. We ceded that to ostensibly our uh, enemies or adversaries. Russia and China were all too willing to step in and, and uh, fill the, the vacuum that occurred because we weren't, we weren't there helping to make international policy on cyber. So those are the kind of the four highlights. There are others, of course, but those are the things that uh, we're most especially focused on. And Director Inglis, as ONCD takes stock of all the cyber efforts, roles, and responsibilities across the federal space, what can you share with us about some of the biggest gaps and vulnerabilities uh, that you'd like to address on the federal side? Yeah, so thanks for that question. Uh, first, let me just go back half a step and say that I, I strongly agree with Congressman Langevin about the merits of the State Department standing up their cyber bureau and bringing diplomacy to bear. Um, to try to make sure that we're working with our partners, our allies, um, to ensure that cybersecurity is done in an international context. 
And to your question here, I, I love the framing of the question. Um, cyberspace, if you think about what it is, the noun, um, it's typically comprised of technology. People are in cyberspace, of course. They make choices that implicate cyber futures. And then there's this third part, which I refer to as doctrine, but it's really about the roles and responsibilities. Do we have those right? And if you're a transgressor, you often think about those in the reverse order. Um, can I take advantage of weak assignment of roles and responsibilities? Is nobody defending something? I'll do that. Um, can I take advantage of people who might not be at that moment up to speed or kind of doing the things they, they need to do to participate in their own defense? And if necessary, I'll go try to find a technology flaw and I'll take advantage of that. You've asked about roles and responsibilities. That's, I think, the most important bit. And I have two concerns there coming into this job, but I think we're addressing both of those. Um, the first would be what I described as uh, willful ambivalence, which is that there is far too often, both in the private and the public sector, this sense that cybersecurity should be a concern, that cyber kind of threats are a problem, but then most folks would immediately conclude that it's somebody else's problem to solve, that somebody should do something about it, but they don't see themselves as being implicated in the solution. We need to make sure that whether you're a CEO or you're an agency head, that you take accountability and responsibility for the digital infrastructure, cybersecurity, as much or more as you take responsibility for your business plan um, or for the people that you hire to essentially execute that business plan. Cyber does not exist for its own sake. The reason race cars have bigger brakes is so they can go faster. The reason we have cyber is so that we can do the things that are dependent upon digital infrastructure. That takes then personal responsibility, professional accountability, all the way up to and including the leadership of these organizations. The second gap that I see is that we still think of cybersecurity as a response issue as opposed to an investment issue. Um, in the parlance of the private sector, we think of it as an operational activity as opposed to a capital expenditure activity. Uh, we're trying to address both of those factors in, in what we're doing within the federal government and by our buying power to drive perhaps some of that best practice into the private sector. The executive order last year made it very clear that we're gonna do resilience by design made it very clear that the agency heads are accountable to ensure that they're responsible for making those investments, following through on those investments, and, and, and frankly, making sure that the practices on top of that digital infrastructure work as intended. We're also, um, as a matter of kind of national policy, about to make an investment of $1.2 trillion, a once in a lifetime investment in our physical infrastructure broadly across the nation, under the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, but we also need to make sure that every one of those dollars is spent in a way that they're cyber aware, because every piece of physical infrastructure increasingly is gonna be dependent on that underpinning digital infrastructure. That's a stunning opportunity to make the capital investments necessary that avoid these perils, that prevent these disasters that we've experienced one after another, so that we can for a generation or two or three ahead take advantage of inherent cyber resilience while we then take benefit of the kind of proceeds of the physical infrastructure investments. So I think we're tending in the right direction, addressing roles and responsibilities, but it requires every one of us to understand what our role and responsibility might be, individuals, organizations, sectors, plural, governments, plural. Thank you for that. And Congressman Langevin, I wanted to give you an opportunity uh, to respond what the director just said, and then maybe add any additional thoughts you have just from your many years of experience in Congress. And I, I know you're preparing to retire, but what are some of your remaining concerns when it comes to cybersecurity, whether we're looking at federal civilian agencies or our military? Well, certainly we need to continue to do a part to raise awareness of the, the threats that we face. Um, and uh, the uh, certainly the uh, the civilian commission's work, of course, is the is the legislative roadmap for the the next Congress and beyond. And so there's lots of unfinished business that uh, that you know we need to continue to focus on. And colleagues of mine will hopefully continue to focus on that in the future. But you know I think that uh, the what uh, the director Engelis, uh, uh had to say is 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 very really spot on. And uh, you know again working closely with the private sector is critically important. Uh, uh, understanding, you know, what's a, you know, it, when you know there's a capital expenditure that needs to be made and the the cause and effect that will result, uh, you know, from uh, doing something or uh, doing nothing, and uh, those are the things that we 
again, need to continue to focus on how do we move to a place where we are uh, more closely uh, aligned uh, with the private sector, working closely with the private sector as a this public-private partnership, uh, but then making sure that uh, wherever uh, we have responsibilities in the federal government to implement policy that we're effectively carrying out those those requirements, those mandates. And I, I also want to, again, applaud the administration for the executive order that President uh, Biden had issued, um, you know, looking at uh, the, the things like um, uh, looking at uh, moving toward uh, zero trust and endpoint security is, is uh, critically important going forward. Uh, the requirement for software bill of materials uh, is another thing that's, that's important so we understand, you know, what vulnerabilities might exist in the software we're using uh, right now. After Solar Winds, you know, we didn't uh, up to that. We didn't know uh, much of the much about the software that was running on the the systems that we're operating. So all of these things combined, uh, we have plenty of work to be done. And I certainly look forward to working with Chris, uh, Director Engel straight straight through to the end of my term uh, to uh, to make sure that we're implementing uh, the remaining work that's uh, that's that's out there. So the private sectors come up, you know, several times in this conversation, and I'd just be curious if either one of you could speak more directly about, you know, what resources can the private sector bring to the table to improve our overall cyber posture? For example, you know, are there certain R&D areas to explore or capabilities that require greater investment? And maybe additionally, is there a role for the private sector to help cultivate a cyber workforce that the government uh, can leverage? Megan, I'm happy to start on that and, um, and let uh, Congressman Langevin grade my homework. Um, I, I would say the answers to those questions is yes, yes, and possibly yes. Um, I just start by acknowledging the private sector owns and operates most of cyberspace to include the vast majority of critical infrastructure. And as I'd indicated earlier, cyberspace is not just the technology, but it is also the people, their skills, and its roles and responsibilities. So the private sector can play a huge role in ensuring that we define those properly, that we develop and deploy kind of assets along each of those three lines, um, and that we take advantage of the scope and scale that the private sector can deliver. Um, so I think the government increasingly needs to see itself in a supporting role, um, such that the kind of private sector sees itself in a supported role. That's a kind of a military term of art but, but understanding the relationship between two organizations, um, I think if the government sees that it needs to take advantage of the private sector, but at the same time support the private sector, we're in the best possible place. With respect to the workforce challenges, I think you've asked a great question. Um, I used to say up until about a week or two ago, um, and I think anyone could have said the same, but the statistics show that we're about 25, 30% short in filling the jobs that have cyber or IT in their job title. That's still true, but the number just changed. Right, while we're still holding an ability to fill somewhere between two thirds and three quarters of those jobs, the number of jobs, the denominator has now significantly increased. Right, so we're now about 770,000 short in filling those jobs. That's an important problem. The private sector needs to help us. We need to help them. We need to do this in a collaboration, examine every aspect of how we've done that. Um, I think that we have shown ourselves able to stay apace proportionately but given that the total number is changing, it, it's not working and we'll fall further behind in absolute numbers. So how do we reassess what's required to occupy these jobs? Have we got the skills properly defined? How do we reassess how we appeal to the broadest possible population? How do we then help that population navigate from aspiration to destination um, along the education, the training, the certification track? We need to re-examine all of that. And that's something that we need to work together. But I would also indicate that while there's 770,000 jobs, that's a riveting statistic. There's probably in excess of 320 million people within the United States who use cyberspace on a daily basis that need to know more than they do about cyberspace than they get by simply using it, by being raised in its proximity. Most of us are not digital natives, we're app natives. We know how to make the next app that we would download on our phone work but we know too little about what the implications are of the choices we make. Um, we know less about cyberspace than we know about a hot stove or about crossing a busy city street. We need to make sure that from the moment our children are introduced to cyberspace, that we teach them those basic fundamentals in the same way that we worry about the manifestation of threat, um, hopefully kind of small that it may be, but we teach them about manifestation threat in the physical space 
let's do the same thing in cyberspace. And then in the middle of that kind of grouping, somewhere between 320 million and 771,000, there are many professions, CEOs, lawyers, computer programmers, electricians, whose choices on a daily basis implicate our cyber resilience and robustness. We need to make sure that we're investing in those programs, that curricula, to give them just a little bit more so that they can make the right choices. Uh, now, in terms of classic research and development, uh, there is a significant role to be played by the private sector, as well as in some cases, the government, which might invest in those things that don't necessarily have a profit incentive at the moment, but, but can be the foundational technology that in the longer term we, we need to develop. Um, but having said that, increasingly we need to see technology as playing a role to support doctrine, to support the people, and not as an independent um, kind of indicator of success. So we, if we get our doctrine right, if we understand what people skills we have, we need, we deliver, we should bend technology to that purpose. Think of those three as being combined because in fact they are combined in cyberspace. I think that that then is something that the private sector can lead once again in reconsidering what the role of technology is in delivering not just the primary visible features of an architecture, but the resilience, the robustness that we expect to come hand in glove with that. Sure, and Congressman, just do you have any thoughts on that in terms of the private sector and how they can better support your congressional cyber efforts as well? Sure. Well, I'm a big believer in the public-private partnership. We've already uh, talked about that briefly, and we need to continue to, to grow that. Um, I do uh, support uh, people from the private sector coming in and working in uh, government for a time, uh, and also cross-pollinating a lot of people in government to go and work in uh, in private sector, uh, we've enhanced those authorities. For example, at the uh, at the uh, within uh, the, the the Pentagon, and uh, they're taking advantage of those those opportunities to do so. Same thing with federal government at uh, Department of Homeland Security. I'd like to see that those opportunities grow uh, for sure. Um, we also need to uh, again, you're going back to joint collaborative environment. Uh, more robust information sharing will help. But in terms of you know, bringing more people into the uh, uh, into cyber jobs that need to be filled. That's both in the interest of the, the government, but also the private sector. And obviously we're, we're trying to compete for, uh, for cyber talent in the government, trying to bring people in and, and retain that talent. But we can't just be thinking about it from you know, growing uh, you know, our slice of the pie, if you will, from government's perspective. We need to grow the whole pie itself so that both private sector and, and government benefit uh, writ large. So clearly, uh, Chris, uh, Director Inglis uh, outlined a lot of it in, important elements of, of how we grow cyber jobs. But I would also uh, just reiterate that we need to focus on, uh, and Chris talked about educating our young people, it, it, throughout the K through 12 system. So the time is, uh, the director said, you know, kids get on the internet that they're already being uh, kind of trained in or made aware of cybersecurity responsibilities and, and things they can do to both keep themselves safe online, but strengthen the whole uh, cyber ecosystem, if you will. And, and uh, the Israelis are very good at that and, and they bake that into their system of education. And by the way, it goes hand in glove with things like uh, keeping them safe online uh, and also understanding, helping them understand the, the digital footprint that they create when they're online and that, you know, things sometimes get, you know, that they get put on the internet, they can stay up there for forever. It's hard to kind of pull that back in there once it's out there and kids really need to be made uh, aware of that. I, I feel for what kids are going through these days and with the, all the pressures they have that, you know, now, you know, is the, the internet and social media and all the things that they have to contend with. But we want to do more to make sure that they are safe online and they understand their responsibilities and, and, and cybersecurity. And we all have those responsibilities, right? Um, but uh, uh, practicing good cyber hygiene, of course, is important. But in terms of uh, growing the, the pie itself, looking for those opportunities to think about uh, uh, channeling uh, our young people into the field of, of cybersecurity jobs that are out there. And, and I should say, this kind of wearing two hats, both of my work on cybersecurity, but also as co-chair of the Career and Technical Education Caucus, uh, recognizing that uh, just a, even a certificate program can lead getting your foot in the door and, and getting a good paying job in the field of cybersecurity. It doesn't necessarily require a two or even a four year degree 
in, uh, in, in cybersecurity, some uh, certificate training will get you on the path to a good paying job in this field. And again, it grows the, the cyber uh, pie of cyber talent that uh, we desperately need in this country because as Director Ingo said, there's just too many unfilled jobs and that those numbers are only growing. Great, well, thank you, Congressman. And just one more question for you. Uh, what do you think the next group of congressional cyber leaders needs to be thinking about and just given all of your experience on the Hill and your ability to get things done and advance cybersecurity, is there, are there any nuggets of wisdom you would like to impart uh, to your younger colleagues up on the Hill? Sure. Well, the, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Cyber Space Security Commission's work uh, in, um, you know, is a basically a legislative uh, roadmap uh, for, uh, for the next Congress and beyond. And so I hope that they follow that roadmap uh, to the nth degree and, and work on uh, continue to implement uh, those recommendations that came out of the, the commission's work. Obviously plenty of unfinished businesses that the business that legislators will need to take up that, that, that can help address key overarching questions such as you know, how do we build more secure technology and software by design? Uh, and uh, how do we uh, improve resiliency of our systems and networks? You know, if you, th if you go back and you think about um, you know, where did our vulnerabilities start? Well, it starts with unsecure code, right? And so there's right now, there's, there's often too much a, 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 a rush to market as opposed to uh, secure to market. So we need to, we need to kind of take a step back and doing more to require uh, secure code uh, be adopted before it's, uh, before it's put out there. Uh, get a, the, the, the Software Bill of Materials requirements, I think that the administration require in the executive order uh, the, the, the SBOM uh, will, will help in that respect to at least identify the software that we're running. And then hopefully we can have requirements in there that's, that focuses more on, on uh, security by design. So um, the Solarium Commission course, also gave rise to new offices and programs and projects that will need both support and oversight from Congress to achieve long-term success. We need to make sure that we're properly funding those policies and programs and things like IT modernization. Uh, but also the oversight to make sure that, uh, that, that we're spending our dollars wisely. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why I was so insistent that uh, the, the National Cyber Director's position be Senate confirmed so that uh, Director Ingalls will, will be required to come to Congress from time to time to share progress on, on, uh, on the, what, what the, the plan is and how do we better secure the country in cyberspace and how well we're implementing it. But it also gives Congress skin in the game that we now have a responsibility to probably fund the request from, for example, a, a, a ONCD and making sure that uh, we're probably resourcing here, the, the director and the, and the, the government programs writ large uh, so that we, we are getting the best bang for a buck and we're probably funding those things that need to be funded. So um, again, there's also a continued role for Congress in helping to build a large, robust and diverse cyber workforce uh, again, important opportunities to partner with the administration and the National Cyber Director's Office in particular in that effort. And, um, you know, there's, there's so many different areas in the cyber realm that need attention and plenty of space for my colleagues to get involved. I highly encourage them also you know, to build relationships uh, in those, those, with those in the field and uh, who have been thinking about these problems for, for several years. Uh, the cybersecurity research community is a big one. I've relied on their expertise. There, there's a cyber experts that just want to make the system work better, and and uh, they're willing to lend their time and their talents or advice uh, if if asked and, and brought in. Great, thank you, and Director Inglis. So we do have an audience here today of a lot of industry that supports the government cyber mission, as well as uh, government cyber operators. But would be curious to hear, is there, is there one thing that you would like to ask of our audience in terms of how we can better support your efforts or just something that we need to be thinking about when it comes to improving our cybersecurity? Yeah, I think um, I'm asked often what keeps me awake at night, and uh, it, it is not a particular threat. Um, it's that point I made earlier, which is some degree of willful ambivalence where um, many would observe there's, there's a problem in this space, but then would further conclude it's somebody else's to solve. Uh, there are roles for all of us, individuals, organizations, private sector, public sector, governments, plural. And each one of us needs to determine what that looks like and lean in, kind of put our shoulder to the wheel. I think the collective kind of uh, goal should be here 
um, what do we do to make it such that all of us can help defend each of us or uh, perhaps uh, make it turn that around, make it such that if you're a transgressor in that space, you've got to beat all of us to beat one of us. That would be different, right? If we agree that that is a, a, an appropriate proposition, and I think it is, we'll then say, well, how do we actually make it such that what we propose to defend together is maximally, optimally defensible? That means resilience by design. And so I would say that's a private sector responsibility and a public sec sector responsibility individually and collectively. That's what I would offer. Let's get the roles and responsibilities right. Let's get the people kind of up to speed and then bend technology to that purpose. Uh, we've done this before for other industries, for other critical functions, whether it's the aviation industry or the automobile industry, uh, we can and will do it for this one too. Sure, and just one final question for today, I would be remiss if I didn't ask, but Congressman Langevin, what's one of your proudest cyber achievements during your time in Congress? Well, it, it certainly has been a long, uh, sometimes a long and, and arduous journey, but a gratifying one, I have to say. Um, when, I, when I first came to Congress in 2001, the NDAA, the, the National Defense Authorization Act, for example, that year didn't even mention the word cyber or internet. Uh, so, um, but it's now apparent to my colleagues, uh, as it's been apparent to me, that cybersecurity is one of the really the preeminent national and economic security issues of our time. Uh, you know, I'm, I've been proud to play even a small role in focusing Congress on this vital issue. But um, I'm, I'm very proud of uh, my contributions and things like helping to establish U.S. Cyber Command as a U.S. US uh, you know, unified Combatant Command. And of course, I'm perhaps most proud of the fact that we now have a, a national cyber director. So um, it's, uh, it's been a, again, a, a long journey to get there and, and many of these things, but uh, also having participated in the Cyberspace Solarium Commission uh, was, uh, was a meaningful moment uh, as well. But I would say uh, establishing uh, uh, the national cyber director is, is probably um, among my proudest accomplishments. Great. Well, thank you, Congressman Langevin and Director Inglis for your thoughts on these very important issues. We're so grateful for the many contributions uh, you make and continue to make in terms of securing our cyberspace. We look forward to our continued collaboration. Thank you again.